today I'm going to speak on men of God, being a triathlete. But as I said when I spoke to the women on Mother's Day, there's stuff here for women, and whether you're a father or not, this is for everybody. Uh, New York Times had an article, what are fathers for? They really didn't know, and a Hannah Rosen uh, answered, responded in an article, I'm not sure a child needs a father. And in a HuffPost article titled, Fathers Are Not Needed. <laughs> wrong. They couldn't be more wrong. Let's look at some statistics about fatherless homes. 85% of youth who are currently in prison grew up in fatherless homes. Seven out of ten youth that are housed in state-operated correctional uh, facilities, including detention resident treatment, come from fatherless homes. Children without a father are four times more likely to be living in poverty than children with a father. Children from fatherless homes are twice as likely to drop out from school before graduating than children who have father in their lives. Children who live in a single parent home are more than two times likely to commit suicide than children from a two-parent home. Uh, living in a fatherless home is a contributing factor to substance abuse, with children from such homes accounting for 75% of adolescent parents being uh, treated in substance abuse centers, 75%. 90% of youth in the United States who decide to run away from home and become homeless for any reason originally come from a fatherless home. And the article I got this from had 36 shocking statistics. I just gave seven. And uh, we have an epidemic of fatherlessness in America. It gets worse. It is spreading. And I know I have some may ch challenge me on this, but I think the epidemic a fatherless in this in America and in our world is causing more deaths and more heartache and more hurt than the COVID pandemic. And I you can think about it. But when you think about all the deaths, all the people in jail, all the crime from fatherless homes. Now again, this is not to attack any women and say, well, women can't do it by themselves. At an age 14, I started being in a single parent home. My father, until he really got into alcohol, had done a good job, though, I think. Uh, but I appreciate people like my mother and single mothers all over who don't, have done a great job. But if you're a parent, you know it's hard when there's two of you in a home raising children. And we need both. God made both for a reason. He's the one who made male and female with differences because we do need both of those. And uh, so we need to understand where we are and get back to what, uh, what, how God made us. Boys grow up and girls grow up both with certain needs that they get from their father. And they need a sense of security and safety that they get a lot of times more from a father. The one good news in this is that there can other people come into their lives as father figures sometimes. It can be grandfathers, uncles, uh, clergy, teachers other people that they know, mentors. I'm going next Sunday, Sandy and I are leaving today, heading towards Maryland, my home state, my home church. I'll be speaking next Sunday for a memorial service for a guy who was a real mentor in my life. Our youth director meant so many to so many people, uh, died back in the winter and we're having a memorial service this Sunday. And my father died when I was 17 and he was a man who helped a lot of us when we needed somebody to look to as an example. And so we can all pitch in and uh, be of help to other people and be there for other people no matter what's going on. Uh, Hurricane Isabel uh, hit in September of 2003 and Congress even left for safety reasons. It came up the East Coast and the president sought shelter and they told the guards at the Tomb of the Unknown Sober, you can seek shelter if you want. What do you think they did? They stayed there. Even when it's blowing stuff around, blowing them around, because an old-fashioned word called duty and honor, they stayed. And that's what we need more of. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And we need that uh, for all of us in our lives, in our society. One guy said, uh, 
I think I have it up here. If these men can stand guard over the dead, how much more important it is that I stand guard over the living. My wife and children. It is important. So, let's talk about this. Oh, a great verse. is very short. 1 Timothy 6.11 But you, Timothy, are a man of God. They say, what's the but there for? Because he's just talking about some things that are wrong, that are bad, that are hurtful. But he says, but you, Timothy, are a man of God. In other words, there's a difference if you're a man of God. You don't just do all these things because you're a man of God. And I can say the same to a woman of God. If you're a walking with God, there should be a difference in our lives in some of these things. And uh, if you're not a man or a woman of God today, i got good news. You can be. God wants you to walk with Him. He wants you to turn to Him for mercy. He wants you to turn to Him for guidance, for strength, for a home with Him in heaven. And so there's good news. If there's, you're listening and you say, well, I'm not a man of God. It doesn't apply to me. You can become a man of God and be the best thing you ever did. You can become a woman of God and be the best thing you ever did. And maybe even today... You could pause and say, God, forgive me for my life without you and ignoring you and going my own way. And I turn my life to Jesus as my Savior and I accept him. And then, God, you give me the strength to follow you and live like I'm supposed to live. And every one of us, and you, it's a great thing to be called a person, a follower of God. All right, so man of God, we want you to be a triathlete. You know what a triathlete is? They compete in three different sports uh, or Trial, so we're going to do that. All right, number one, a man of God is a running man. He runs. He runs first from evil things. And where did I get that from 1 Timothy 6, 11? Run from all these evil things. That wasn't hard. If you've ever seen the show Walking Dead, you may have ever seen Walking Dead or some zombie show, some of you had. If you've got a thousand zombies walking your way and you're by yourself with no weapon, what do you do? You run. <laughs> That's what I think we, this is what he's talking about. These evil things, run. Get out of there. Get away from it. Stay away from it. Don't just babble around in there so often I'll drive this out. That's too dangerous. Just So, run from, here's a few things, the love of money. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires. Now, let's stop right there and look at it. This is not saying people that are rich. What's it say? They long to be rich. They want to be rich. You know, somebody said, I wish I could get close enough to that money to get tempted by it. You know, but it's... <laughs> but that's, that's it. When we want to be rich, that's where the temptation... It's not just those rich people. It can be any of us that plague them and plunge them to ruin and destruction. So it's a, it's a dangerous thing. There's been people who have a fruit of all kinds of evil, craving money, have wandered from the faith. They've left walking with Jesus because they loved money and pierced themselves with many sorrows, caused a lot of heartache. The love of money can be so dangerous. And we're talking 2,000 years ago. If it's anything else, it's worse, not easier. To love money than want more money. And I need more money. That's not enough. I need just some more money. And boy, if I could have to have some more money, and then some more money, and it never ends. You think Jeff Bezos is satisfied? <laughs> no way. He wants more money. He had to give a lot to his wife, but he still he, <laughs> he, he, he wants more money. Everybody wants more money, but it's dangerous. It causes you to lie and cheat and steal and hurt other people. And cheat your employees if you're rich sometimes because you love money. And so it's a dangerous thing uh, and we need to be careful about that and run from that. The true story in the Klondike when they had a gold strike, two miners went there and sure enough they discovered gold. But it was coming on to winter. They knew they needed to go get some supplies to, for the winter, some food and warm clothes, but they wanted to get some more gold. And then a first blizzard hit. It shut down the passes. They couldn't get out. And one of them wrote a note about their foolishness 
of not planning ahead and looking to the future, what was going to happen. And the next spring fall, they found both of them with the note lying on top of a pile of gold. Didn't do them any good. So let's just be careful about the love of money. Now, you know, work hard, save money, buy the things you need. I'm not against money. Just be careful about loving it. All right, number two, or number uh, second, run from sexual sin. Where did I get that? It says run from sexual sin. I am so creative. Now, let me just stop right there. Here's what's happening in America today and in the Western world. They would say there is no sin in anything about sex. You can do whatever you want. There is no such thing as a sexual sin. But here the Bible says, run. God who created sex to be beautiful and wonderful in the way that he made it, and it is, says there's ways that you use that that are hurtful and harmful and against the way I planned. And so we need to run from that, from sexual sin, and be care of that. It says run from sexual sin because no other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. It hurts yourself eventually in a lot of ways. Now, I have never, ever watched The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, but I read about this. In the 15th season of The Bachelorette, Christian contestant Luke Parker told Bachelorette Hannah Brown that he wanted a wife who believed what he believed regarding sex, which he said is found in the Bible in Hebrews 13.4, which Hebrews 13.4 says this, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and commit adultery. And he said, this is what I'm looking for, a wife. Well, Hannah Brown, who was also a perfecting Christian, became incensed. She took offense. And she said, well, I admit I've had a lot of physical relations with all the other candidates, but Jesus still loves me. But see, this the question is not whether Jesus still loves you. God loves the world. But that doesn't mean he approves of everything that everybody does. We can't use that statement, Jesus still loves me, to justify anything we do. And we have to be careful with that in separating the love of God from the way that he's taught us to live. I read about one Christian man who was unfaithful to his wife. He got found out, you know how that goes. He confessed it, she forgave him. They took months to rebuild. He thought it was all oh, good, everything was good, till he came home early from work one day and he heard his wife in there crying and praying, God help me to deal with the hurt of what my husband did to me. And he realized the cost of sin. You don't sin and get away from it. You don't sin and go away against God's principles without it hurting somebody, and probably you too. So all of us need to, it's rampant, it's in the atmosphere. I know that. But I'm saying to you as a warning, run from sexual sin. And then see, run from youthful lust. And it says in 2 Timothy, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Now not only does the lust for pleasure, and I think I might have this, let me see what I have here. Not only does the lust for pleasure lead to sex outside of marriage, but it leads to powerful addictions to alcohol and drugs because I just want to get high and have fun and do, do it with my friends. It leads to wasting time. It leads to not growing as a person and it not being the mature, dependable person we need. We need to be careful of youthful lusts and grow up. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I spoke to a child, I act like a child, but when I became a man, I grew up and put away childish things. And we need some men who will grow up. It's too easy to have permanent adolescence in America today. To make your life still, your main goal in life is Netflix and, and games and taking it easy. And for a boy to act seven when he's seven is fine. For a 27-year-old to act like he's seven is not good. For a 41-year-old to act like he's 11 is not good. We've got to have some men who grow up. And be a man of God. Just be a man. Be mature. And youthful lust can tempt us to get into things that just waste our life. And we don't want to do that. 
But he said, run after good things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, gentleness. It's been a long time since my youth director was my youth director back in Maryland. And when I go back, one of the things that I love so much that I've been seeing and talking to people for all these years that persevered in their life for Christ and living for, good, for God. That's one of the main things we need to do. Just keep on going. Persevere. Stay with it. He says, pursue this. It's like you're in a football game, whether it's a pickup game or, or in high school or college, whatever it is, and you're a receiver and you're running down and he throws a little longer, you're running as fast as you can and stretch as far as you can to catch that ball. That's how we need to be about God's ways. To pursue it. Now, not just be passive. Well, if you know anything floats over and hits me in the head. No, we need to. What are we doing? What are we doing to pursue good things in life? To pursue growing up? Are we being faithful in church? You are. I'm glad for that. Are we trying to get in the Bible and the Word anywhere during the week? Through some kind of podcast or book? Are we trying to hang around some good friends who are going to help us grow? He says pursue. Pursue these things. If we're going to be men and women of God, we've got to make an effort. We don't need to just be passive. We don't need more passive people who just see what happens. It doesn't matter what your personality is. We're, you're supposed to make an effort. And I'm supposed to make an effort to be what we should be. All right, that's running. First part of the triathlon number two, a man of God is a fighting man. Fight the good fight. For the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life which God has called you, which you have confessed so well before many witnesses. Now, do you believe there is anything in this life we're fighting for? I'm looking for nods, getting them, thank you. Certainly there's some things we're fighting for. I mean, if you're a if you're a husband, your wife is worth fighting for, isn't she? If you're a father, your children's worth fighting for, aren't they? If a, if a mean dog was coming at one of your kids or grandkids, what would you do? You'd get between them and the dog. <laughs> fight it off. You'd fight for it. We need to fight for what is good and right. If somebody is there and is hurting and they don't have anybody else to help them, we should fight for them. I saw a video this week of a man in New York City, 82-year-old man, in a store trying to buy something and a young guy comes up to him and wants to take his money and he says what are you doing and, and he goes and he's hitting the old man 82 year old man with a cane in the face and there's a couple of men standing by didn't do anything what do we call the actions of those stand by cowards. cowards that's what they are we don't want to be cowards we don't want to be cowardly in what is right we need to stand up for some things and fight for some things and fight for uh, not just your children, but other children around you. Did you hear those statistics where they don't think anybody loves them and they don't think there's any hope and they commit suicide and they're going to jail? And it, we think it doesn't mean anything. Somebody's got to fight for them. Somebody's got to stand up and this is the way and love them. And we can't just be passive and ignore it. And so there are those that we need fighting for, and we need to fight for the cause of Christ. It's worth fighting for. And I say this, I put it in writing so you would understand, I'm not talking about holding, uh, I'm going to go to the next one here, what else? Yeah, the first one before that. Sorry, Anthony. It's worth fighting for, I'm not talking about killing infidels, right? I want to get this short, I'm not talking about go shoot people. Well, I mean, there is a time to shoot people, but that's, <laughs> you know, if you're in the army or police, I'm not talking about that, go shoot people. If you're defending your home, they come in and break your home, and they're endangering your family, shoot them. <laughs> you come in my home with a gun, I'm going to shoot you. Well, not you, you guys, I'm right. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But I'm not talking about killing infidels. I'm talking about taking the stand for Jesus Christ no matter what others think. No matter what they say or no matter what they do. Because some people don't like it that you follow Christ. And some people are going to tell you that they don't like it. 
that you follow Christ. And in some places, they're even going to do something about it. And I'm saying we need to be courageous, not cowardly. Be courageous, not cowardly, and stand up and say, Jesus Christ is worth it. If I die, he's worth it. Well, at work, maybe I'm at work somewhere. You don't, you don't really go to church, do you, Pitcher? Well, you know, I like to please my wife. She likes me to go once in a while. Courageous or cowardly? Cowardly. cowardly. Well, what about, Richard, what about that part of the Bible that teaches this? And, you know, that's not popular. You don't believe all that Bible, do you? Well, no, no. Not that part. You know, I, I don't want to get in trouble. Is that courageous or cowardly? Uh, we know that. Have God help us to live it. We need God's help and strength to be courageous, not cowardly. And have duty over selfishness and for those around us. In April 2014, a ferry in Seoul, South Korea capsized. 304 people were killed. 250 of them were high school students waiting for the announcement to get off the boat. And they drowned. 250 high school students drowned. And you know why they didn't get the announcement? Because the captain got off the boat first thing and got himself <laughs> saved. Courageous or cowardly? Of course, he got a lot of black water. I think he might have even went to jail, rightfully so. But we have a duty to fight for what is right and what is true and those who need us. And number three, a man of God is a kneeboarding man. Now, that's the only sport I could find you did on your knees, okay? So I had to. <laughs> but it's a real one. It's like a scuba diving, not scuba diving. A... Surfing? Surfing? No, not surfing. Anyhow, we're water skiing on, knee, on your knees. Okay. All right, thank you. But anyhow, it was, you know, we want to depend on God by getting on our knees. First Timothy again. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust money, which is so unreliable, very true. Their trust should be in God. And so we should trust in God. That's get on our knees. For when I am weak, then I am strong, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. Here's what I've seen over my years of being a pastor. Some people, when they're very needy, they got problems in their family or in their job or with money, and they're just they're crying out. They come to church and they need God and they ask for prayer. And then the job goes better, and their marriage seems to get along for a while, and then they just well, they don't need God anymore. They get proud and think that you know what? They still need God as much as they ever did. We all do. That's why I say we need to get on our knees. We always need. To be on our knees. The only way we're going to be courageous enough to stand up and fight and run the right direction is when we get on our knees and get God to help us. When we depend on our own strength, we're just so weak. We can't trust money. We can't trust physical strength. It could it could leave us. I had a guy in our church in, when I was in Newcastle, Delaware. His brother was Mr. He was a bodybuilder. He was Mr. Mid Atlantic. From his bodybuilding. Nice guy. But he got leukemia. And as strong as he looked, his body was killing him from the inside. And he died a young man in his 30s. Because our body strength can fail us. You know, whatever else we depend on can fail us. But God will never fail us. So we need to trust in him. We need to be on our knees every day. God, help me to be the husband I ought to be, the wife I ought to be, the father I ought to be, the Christian I ought to be. Help us, God. And with this story of John Harper of the Titanic, 1912, over 1,500 people lost their lives. You knew from the Titanic sunk. A story that you don't often hear about, a true story, is this man. Christian man on his way with his six-year-old daughter to America. He had been widowed, and so he's raising his daughter by himself. When they, you know, they, the boat started to sink, he took his six-year-old daughter and kissed her, which he knew would be goodbye, and put her on the boat. 
By the way, she lived to be 80 years old. She died in 1986. He gave away his life jacket and he started around talking to people and praying for people. And he'd say, men, or, uh, women, children, and unsaved, you better get on the lake. And he started going around, and then at 2.40 in the morning, the Titanic sunk, and over a 1,000 people were in the icy cold water. John Harpy would swim away. He was on a piece of uh, a thing, something to hang on to, but he'd swim over to say, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? And if they'd say yes, then good, God. And he'd go to another, and he would tell them how to be saved. He went from person to person until he finally drowned too. They had a reunion of the uh, survivors of the Titanic. And one man by the name of Steve Crane got up and some others told too what, what, John, what he had done, John Harper had done. And he said he came to me and asked me, was I saved? And I knew it wasn't. And I prayed with him there, become a Christian that night. He didn't make it, but I did. I'm John Harper's last convert. Now what do I say to that? I say he died good. Now we all got to die. Let's die good. Let's live good so we can die good. Let's be courageous and think of others. God help us to be men of God and women of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the examples of many fathers, men, women of others who have brought the faith down to us.